Hey everybody, Dennis here with Respiratory Sensei. You know, when we look at an arterial blood gas, we love looking at the PaO2. We love the PaO2 because we love oxygen. Nothing bad about oxygen. Then when we look at the carbon dioxide, well, we're not as happy. We don't like the carbon dioxide because we're always trying to get rid of it. But what are we supposed to think about the HCO3, also called the bicarb? Well, it turns out that bicarb is hiding a dirty little secret. And we need to understand a little bit more about bicarb. So let's take a look. All right, so what is it exactly that the bicarbonate is hiding? And to understand that, we have to look at the molecular structure of bicarbonate and pull it apart. So if you look closely, you'll see there's one hydrogen atom, and there's one carbon atom, and then there's three oxygen atoms. And now with those parts and pieces sitting on the table, look at what we can build with it. We can take the carbon atom and add just two of the oxygen atoms, and what we have is CO2. So if you want to know what bicarbonate is hiding in Inside of it, the answer is carbon dioxide, which we don't like. And that means we could take a bicarbonate molecule, pull it apart, and it would yield carbon dioxide, which in, a, in essence is our enemy most of the time. But at the same time, we can also say that if we have carbon dioxide in the blood, we can pull it apart and add a hydrogen and another oxygen molecule to it or an oxygen atom to it, and we can form bicarb and hide the CO2 that's in our blood and essentially hide the negative effects from the CO2. And so because of that, bicarbonate is hiding a dirty little secret, but it's sometimes our friend because it can hide the CO2 that's in our blood that may be accumulating and causing an acidic effect. Now on that subject, let me talk about that just for a moment. When we look at CO2, we basically think that it causes acidosis in the blood, and it does. It does have an acidic effect. It's actually not the CO2 directly that's causing the acid. It by itself is not acid, but it can degranulate and cause other factors that promote acidity. And so that doesn't really matter that we understand that perfectly, just that if CO2 goes up, then acidity is also going to occur. Acidity means in, meaning that the blood pH is going to fall. Remember, we're trying to keep the pH in a very narrow range of acidity and alkalinity, 7.35 to 4.5 to be exact. And you can look at my other video to learn more about that. But we are trying to help keep it there. And if CO2 goes up, then we're moving towards acidity, which we don't like. However, if carbon dioxide, of course, develops too much, then the bicarb can form. And that's because bicarb has a basic effect. In other words, as the bicarb goes up, then the effect is more alkalinity in the blood. In other words, the pH would go up. So that's pretty handy. That means the bicarb is both our enemy and our friend at times. It has the ability to release CO2, which is our enemy, but it also has the ability to absorb CO2 or at least hide it inside of its molecule. And that also hides it from the negative effects of CO2. And that's why we kind of have that love-hate relationship with bicarb. And so let's take a look at that a little bit closer. All right, now let's take a look closer at the bicarbonate molecule. We already said that inside of the bicarbonate molecule is CO2, and when we pull the CO2 out, one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms, what we're left is one hydrogen atom and one oxygen atom. Now the oxygen atom is not a problem because all it has to do is combine with another oxygen atom and we get the diatomic form of stable oxygen. In other words, we get O2, which is something our body needs in the first place. It's the hydrogen that's the problem. And that's because hydrogen likes to combine with anything and it is the real source of anything becoming an acid. So in other words, even in your stomach, if you look at hydrochloric acid, that's called HCl. Or if you looked at H2SO4, that's sulfuric acid. That's like battery acid. And then, of course, if you look at H2CO3, then that's carbonic acid that runs around in the body. Basically, H with anything very often has an acidic effect. And so that's a problem. However, when it's with HCO3, it has a basic effect. So we don't like hydrogen running around on its own. So that's the problem with that. And that's why when a bicarbonate molecule falls apart, it produces hydrogen, and somewhere along the line, that's where the acid comes from. So we like bicarb to stay together for the most part. 
But just to remind us, we like bicarb because it has the ability to hide CO2 within its molecular structure. And when it does hide the CO2 and forms bicarbon, HCO3, then the CO2 in the blood does not have the same negative effect. So it does have the ability to help us out. The problem is that it, it forms very, very slowly. So if somebody's breathing and they're not breathing enough and their CO2 is climbing, you might think that bicarb can come to the rescue. And it can, but not in the short term. It does come to the rescue but it sometimes takes hours, even days, and even weeks to form, especially in a chronic situation where the CO2 is always high. And so we do like bicarb, but it doesn't save our life in the short term, but it can help us in the long term. Most notably, the bicarb can help us in the case of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is when a patient is unable to breathe over a long period of time, and they're not able to clear sufficiently the CO2 out of the blood. That means CO2 is gonna accumulate in the blood and stay there, not for just a day, but for weeks, months, months and even years. So what will happen is the bicarbonate system will kick in and the bicarb will increase. Now look, consider this. If a COPD has rising CO2, then that means their blood is going to become increasingly acidic. But given time, the bicarb can compensate for that by rising itself and having a more basic influence. And it can rob the CO2 and just kind of hide it away, squirrel it away, so the body doesn't see the negative effect of that. And that's why if you look at a COPD blood gas, which you'll see as a high CO2, well, you should see acidity, but you don't. You look at the pH and it's at its normal 7.35 to 7.45. And that's because bicarb has hidden the CO2 molecule managing in that. And in that way, that's why the COPD can have a high CO2, but we can still maintain a normal pH because bicarb is coming to the rescue over the long run. All right, now let me just clarify some terms and some processes here. Whenever CO2 in a body is going up or down, it's doing so because the breathing is changing in the patient. I know there's other processes in the body, such as urination, that can get rid of CO2, but none of those processes do it quickly. What's really controlling the carbon dioxide in the blood is really breathing in and out. Because of that, we want to use the term respiratory process. And that makes sense, because respiratory is all about breathing. So CO2 goes up and down, then what we should equate that with is the respiratory process. However, when we look at bicarbonate, that's not associated with the respiratory process. So when it goes up or down, it's something Thing that is coming from the kidneys. It's a kidney function, and therefore we're going to call that a metabolic process. So that's a good foundation for us to lay right now as we talk about this. If CO2 is going up and down, that's a respiratory process. Therefore, in the interpretation of the problem, we're going to use the word respiratory. But if it's the bicarb going up or down, then we're going to use the word metabolic. Now, let's go back to the COPD. Remember we said their CO2 is high, and if their CO2 is high, that's gonna cause acidosis, and it's happening because they're not breathing enough because we're dealing with CO2, so we're gonna say respiratory acidosis. We're gonna say a COPD patient has respiratory acidosis. However, when we look at the pH and we find out it's normal, we also discover that the bicarbonate is also elevated. And whenever the bicarbonate is, is changing its level or it's involved, we're gonna call that metabolic. And Therefore, we're going to say this, because the pH is compensated to normal acid base, we're going to say metabolically compensated, remember that's because of the bicarb, respiratory acidosis, that's because the CO2 is high. So a COPD's ABG would be metabolically compensated respiratory acidosis. All right, now let's look at one other final situation here. Sometimes we might look at the carbon dioxide in a blood gas and find out that it's normal. Therefore, they don't have acidity or alkalinity, and there is no respiratory problem. The respiratory system's working quite well. But still, we look at the pH, and if we find that it is either high or low, in other words, it's either alkalotic or acidic, then we can confirm that the problem is not coming from the respiratory system. And therefore, we would plainly put the term on it, metabolic. So if it's alkalosis, we would say metabolic alkalosis or metabolic acidosis. That's a pure metabolic problem because the CO2 is normal, yet the pH is not in its normal range. All right, and that's what we learn about the bicarbonate. Now we can get great detail and we will in some other videos, but just wanted to give you an overview of the sodium bicarbonate molecule and its dirty little secret that it's hiding CO2. 
but it's also a good secret that it can hide CO2. It can take CO2 out of the blood and put it in a place where it doesn't cause us harm. I hope you've enjoyed this and learned something a little bit more about HCO3 or the bicarbonate in the blood. I'm Dennis Stanley with Restore Sensei. If you want to see more videos like this, please hit the subscribe button and the notify button so you don't miss anything when it comes out. I'll see you later. Thank you.